Now we begin talking about perception and attention, which is the gateway to the soul. The doors of perception are sprung open when we have some important new insight. There's a painting that maybe captures that kind of qualitative idea about the importance of perception. Some other strange stuff going on there. Uh, this is actually something I did on a Amiga computer way back in college. So uh, we're going to try to break down and understand how perception works in terms of building up from these basic principles of uh, different uh, low-level pixel-like elements all the way up to high-level concepts uh, and hopefully achieve some important understanding of how we see the world and maybe we, how we see things that aren't there in the world and uh, accurately see also what is there. As usual, we're going to start with the biology. So here we have a kind of top-down view. These are the eyeballs. You have uh, some information maybe in the right visual field, and that hits both eyes, and that's important for stereo vision, that you get kind of two samples of the same visual field. And if you trace, you know, kind of the rays of light from, from a point in that right visual field, you can see that it's hitting the left side of your left eye uh, and the left side of your right eye as well. First of all, it's processed by several layers of neurons within the retina itself and then um, gets passed out through axons via the retinal ganglion cells uh, in this optic pathway. And we have this kind of crossover effect that recombine that splits apart and recombines these right and left visual field so that you actually end up with just the uh, left visual field going to the right eye and the right visual field going to the left eye. This causes no end of confusion because you know you're talking about the right side of space but it's encoded in the left side of the brain vice versa but uh, that's the way it works there's actually some pretty interesting ideas about how that might be beneficial for navigating in the right way uh, but in any case that's what this crossover does there's a synapse here in the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus which allows that visual information to be kind of further organized and stratified according to different types of photoreceptors, uh, color versus uh, monochrome, so the cones versus the rods, etc. Um, and then that goes on from there up into V1, as we've talked about, primary visual cortex, and then further up to these higher levels. There's a kind of interesting question to think about what uh, does the resolution of our visual system, how does it compare with current day devices. Uh, you may have heard a few years ago that Apple introduced something called the retina display as a way of trying to say that it was matching the visual resolution of our retinas. Uh, and if you do the math and look at it kind of at a typical viewing uh, distance, you can come up with a calculation of about 300 dpi, a little over 300 dots per inch. Interestingly, that is exactly what was the original standard for laser printers when those first came out. Uh, and, you know, that, that was the point at which people could not distinguish the individual dots. So that also corroborates that idea. And this is a, a diagram of how, as a function of the angle away from the center of vision, so there's a very important spot here right in the middle, uh, we have the fovea portion of the retina, and that is where the most dense optic uh, receptors are. And so these photoreceptors known as cones, which are sensitive to color differences, are really concentrated right there around the fovea, and that's where you get this really high resolution view of the world, but you can see it very quickly drops off and you have much lower sampling density for anything outside of the fovea. It is it's not really a discrete point, it's just kind of a fall off as you can see there. Um, and so the reason we constantly move our eyes around all the time is because we really are only seeing a very small slice of the world in its highest resolution. And everything else is kind of an illusion. We think it's all there, but it's only there because whenever we look at it, it's still there and we can see it in high res. But then when we look in the other way, that stuff over there is only very coarsely sampled by our visual system. And it's only because we can go back and look at it and we see it again and we kind of have a memory of what it looked like uh, 
that we kind of have this illusion that we see everything in high resolution out there in the world, but we're only seeing a tiny little slice. And that's because it takes many, many neurons to get this very high resolution coding, many, many receptors. And so it's much more efficient to just sample uh, over time what you need to sample at high resolution and otherwise have a very much more kind of broad, low, low frequency kind of sample of the world. Interestingly, right in the retina, the brain starts encoding visual information in a very efficient way. And this really is a theme that goes, carries throughout the entire brain. This notion that we encode information in terms of contrast. So instead of encoding sort of absolute values, we encode relative values. And that's really the same principle as this kind of tug of war, relative encoding of strengths of positive and negative signals. All these same ideas about kind of the relativity of, of neural encoding start off right there in the retina in terms of these on-center versus off-center cells. Um, so in an on-center cell, the, the neuron responds if there happens to be a little bit more light in the center portion of its receptive field compared to the outer part. So this is a sort of diagram in 2D space um, projected if onto our visual system that would tell you for a particular retinal cell where it, it gets more excited in the, in the red central portion or more inhibited in the surrounding um, blue section. Uh, this is a kind of cross-section of what these things actually look like. They can be modeled computationally as a difference of Gaussians or a dog filter. Um, and I first learned about them from a, a professor named John Dogman, interestingly. Um, and, uh, and so that gives you sensitivity to contrast. So in fact, if you illuminate these things with uniform kind of consistent patterns of light, they have no net activity because the positive and the negative cancel out. And so uh, what that means is shown over here that they're actually very sensitive to contrast. Places in the visual world where things go from being dark to light, as you can see here, or vice versa, and in terms of the off-center, uh, you get transitions from dark to light, etc. In the retina, this encoding is kind of radially symmetric, so you, you can have these contrasts sort of anywhere coming along here. But uh, when you go up into area V1, primary visual cortex, a particular alignment of these on-center, off-center kind of receptive fields is created through the connections into a particular V1 neuron, and that establishes a oriented edge detector. So essentially, only when you see a transition, as you can see overlaid here, from a dark, relatively dark portion of the image to a relatively bright portion of the image. When that happens to align with the on-center, off-center tuning of the individual ganglion cells feeding into this B1 cell, that's when you actually get maximal activation. So if we diagram these down here, you can see this kind of uh, transition from uh, in, in, in redder tones here, light to dark, or dark to light, so they have different polarities going uh, from one to the other. Uh, and then angles, uh, as we can see, we only need to really coarsely sample uh, four different angles, horizontal, 45, vertical, and 135. That's enough to tell us essentially a lot about um, the different orientations because as with color itself, you can interpolate the intermediate angles as a relative activity between these two different uh, coarse uh, coatings of angles. So these can be modeled with, with something that we call Gabor filters. It's just a mathematical equation for a sine wave that gives that kind of rippling-like uh, portion of it times a Gaussian, which kind of localizes the overall uh, uh, receptive field to a particular point in space. We know that uh, these Gabor filters are a good description of simple cell firing in the visual cortex, but that uh, you can go higher up into uh, the complex cells in the superficial layers of V1, and these um, have things called end stopping and length summing, um, and so we can actually build in some of those 
more complex detectors, which are, are give you a little more contrast for the other dimension, the kind of edges or ends of the of these oriented edges. Um, and we build this all into our visual system that we use in our models in this chapter so that we don't have to have the system learn it, at least that's in the second part. Initially, we'll see how it learns these kinds of oriented edge detectors from natural visual statistics. As we noted before, there's a hierarchy of visual processing. So once that visual information goes into V1 and you have these very uh, characteristic oriented edge detectors that we just saw, from there you get this division into the kind of what uh, pathway going into the ventral uh, parts of visual cortex versus the where pathway. And we're going to really be focusing initially on this what pathway and thinking about object recognition and then we'll look at how these pathways interact in the context of attention to explain how uh, kind of spatialized representations in this uh, where pathway which encode different spatial locations of visual information how that can allow you to focus attention on different parts of visual space and recognize objects particularly in those locations so that's kind of a quick overview of, of the kind of phenomena we'll be start, we'll be looking at but we'll start off by really going into depth into how v1 learns what it learns